This a feel good, y'all. Y'all better be thankful for what you got. Some people may not have that, but just be thankful. Whatever you got, let's go. Oh, you may not drop a baby Cadillac. Gangsta white walls, mm. TV antenna in the back. You may not have mm, a car at all, yeah. but I remember, brothers and sisters, you can still stay tall. Just be thankful mm, for what you got. Hey friends, welcome to Welcome. My name is Roberto Ortiz and I am the co-founder and CEO of Welcome, this platform that we're using today. I see already that the chat is lit. I mean, we K Poor Smash always brings the best people together. Uh, you guys know how to how to host an event, and I'm glad that you guys are doing it here at Welcome. Uh, today we have a lot to discuss, and there's gonna be an amazing panel featuring Kent Powers, who's in the green room right now. And I'm going to be sitting in the audience along with you guys to enjoy the conversation. It's a lot of good stuff to take away um, here today. Uh, just kind of put a picture in your mind. There are over 500 people right now and more and more tuning in and coming into the auditorium. So picture yourself in a group of 500 people here. You're invited. You're here. Lean in. Be involved in comments and questions. And those will get to you in momentarily. Now, just a few housekeeping things I want to cover here while we have you. We have public chat on the right-hand side. You guys know there's an emoji tray there. Feel free to express yourself throughout this duration of, of this conversation. We also have Q&A. Um, there's a tab there on the right-hand side where you can drop questions that we'll eventually get to uh, towards the, the second half of our time here. And if you have any questions about technology, I have my crew backstage ready to answer that and help. So there's a help chat uh, tab there, and we can get that going. Uh, a couple of things uh, I want to discuss before we kick off here um, is Smash program itself. 
uh, you know, my background, I grew up in North Philly, a single mom, uh, not really given much of opportunities around technology and STEM. And um, it was back when I was about 16 years old, there was a smash like program, a champion just like smash that said, you know what, we're going to create opportunities for perspective change. We're going to open up doors of opportunity so folks can understand what's out there in the world. So folks can be open to maybe something different. And that's why I've always been a big, big champion of, of everything smash because I was once in that row. I was a, a young, hungry Latino guy from North Philly trying to ask the question, what's beyond my zip code? What's beyond the 215? And fast forward, I had an opportunity to go work at Lockheed Martin and then Google and transitioned to Silicon Valley. And today I'm the CEO and co-founder of this platform, and I'm honored to support and be able to host these kind of events. And so you're there, lean into these conversations. These can be perspective changing uh, types of insights for you and your future career. So with that, I want to, if you guys can give it up in chat, help me welcome um, we have a, a Smash alumni joining us here in the green room. She's going to come up on stage. Give it up for Aaliyah. All right, y'all. Welcome to the Smash Speaker Series. I am Aaliyah Ravacaba, a Smash alumni who attended Smash Academy at UC Davis. I'm currently a sophomore majoring in biological sciences, also at UC Davis. So as always, many thanks and welcome Smash friends and supporters for joining us here today. And welcome to all of you who are being introduced to Smash for the very first time. Smash is an out of school enrichment program for high school students of color who are underrepresented in the SMAT, or excuse me, in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields or STEM. Smash starts for students in the ninth grade and continues through their senior year of high school. Over those three years, SMASH invests thousands of hours in each scholar through a five-week program held on a college campus. This program is unique in how it combines rigorous STEM coursework, mentorship, and a social justice curriculum. After completing SMASH Academy, scholars are given the opportunity for a real-world work experience in college internships with leading companies made possible through our alumni program, SMASH Rising. Currently, there are 10 SMASH sites serving young people in communities across the country. SMASH was founded by Dr. Frida K. Porkline, and over the last 18 years, it has changed the lives of thousands of young people and created a pipeline of diverse STEM talent. SMASH scholars graduate with bachelor's degrees and in a STEM field at nearly three times the national rate. Throughout SMASH's well-rounded program from high school through college, students like me not only build academic skill and gain work experience, but we build the confidence, the networks, and life skills necessary for successful STEM careers and to create innovations that impact our communities, communities of color. There aren't a lot of kids that look like me in my regular classes or throughout the school year. Like I'm often one of the only African American girls in my classes. But at SMASH, that changes. I wanted to apply to SMASH because I want to be an environmental engineer and learn how to own my own environmental engineering firm. Me coming in this program feels like an enhancement because I'm feeling because I'm just catching up. I'm finally catching up. We're studying environmental injustice and contamination among low income and primarily uh, people of color communities. Computer science, physics, like your sciences, your mathematics, and even design thinking. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. I was like, this fits into my category of what I want to be, and I was like, okay, I got this. Having somebody that looks like us teach us and mentor us is like an amazing opportunity. I am first generation American, so I don't have those roots that my peers might, and don't have those connections that my peers might have, and SMASH are those roots. Like SMASH creates those roots for me, or kind of like plants the seed for me so that I can have those roots later on. I've never even like heard of computer science, 
before I came on came into this program and I care about science I care about math I care about like, getting into college like I care about my future whose life stories are similar to mine and other scholars. And despite any challenges that they have faced along the way, rose to the top and continue to reach back and bring others along. So I'm excited to present our speaker, Mr. Kent Powers, to our SMASH scholars who are joining us here today and to you, our guests. Mr. Powers' life and career journey has helped him to become a catalyst for change in the film industry from his screenwriting and the award-winning film One Night in Miami, a fictionalized account of a meeting between historical figures, to becoming the first African-American to co-direct a Disney animated feature with his highly celebrated and award-winning film, Soul. Today, Mr. Powers will be in conversation with Ms. Artie Shahini, award-winning journalist and creator and the host of the podcast, Art of Power. Their conversation will be followed by a brief Q&A and words from the Smash CEO, Ms. Danielle Rose. Again, thank you for joining us here today and please help me welcome Mr. Powers to the stage. Um, I'm going to try one more time. Kent Powers, are you able to hear me? Yes, I hear you. I'm here. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. It's really wonderful to meet you. I guess I have to settle for virtual. I wish this were in person, but I know. I wish we. I wish we could do this in person, but then, but then I'd actually have to put on pants and. <laughs> Ditto, exactly. I'm wearing pants. I'm wearing exactly. pants. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't ask you to stand up at any point during our conversation. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, Aaliyah already gave a little bit of your bio, but there's a way that I want to frame it because I love it. And, you know, you have this incredibly impressive resume. First African-American director of Pixar film, writer of One Night in Miami, nominated for an Academy Award. And this is the key thing. Not five years before these distinctions, you were a freelance journalist doing contract work for AOL, a job without health insurance. Right. That's amazing. Or yeah. Is it? Yeah. I mean, look, the reality of it is, is that, I mean, I'm generation X and, you know, my parents' generation was accustomed to working at jobs at a company for their entire lives. But our generation had to learn to be a lot more flexible. You know what I mean? And it's not uncommon for, for anyone from our generation to have two or three careers over the course of your life. I mean, honestly, I thought I was going to retire as a journalist. Um, it was, it really did feel like a dream career for me. Um, I started off writing for my school newspaper and I really took to, to, to writing. And I, I honestly could not see a world where I wasn't a, a journalist. Unfortunately, with the internet becoming what it was, a lot of people who did what I did became devalued and we got devalued pretty quickly. You know, the idea of just being incredibly accurate and doing your due diligence as a reporter 
that that skill didn't become that skill wasn't as valued when it became more about who was first as opposed to who was accurate. Who was first to break news to yeah, have a headline right. out there? Exactly. Who right. the, it didn't even matter if the headline was wrong or the story was wrong. It was about being first. And I was really devoted to accuracy. So in a way, that almost made me kind of a, a bit of a dinosaur, um, which mm -hmm. is crazy to say that I was a dinosaur in my 30s um, in, in the industry that I was in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's not uncommon for someone mid-career to, to lose a job because, and then take on the very same job at another organization, but you're just making less money or, or aren't uninsured. It's something that it's not unique to journalists. It's a lot of people all, all over this country. Right. So, I, think it's, I think it's such an important aspect of you and what you represent, because I think that we sometimes have a temptation to look at someone and kind of ascribe, you know, it must have been a straight path. And this person was right. And you're shaking no, your head. No, <laughs> it, was a roller, it was a roller coaster. And there were so many valleys. There really, really were. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because that job that you mentioned at AOL, that was the that was the last journalism job I, I, I did. And and I and I probably would have continued trying to do that job while I was working on my screenwriting career if I didn't I hadn't had a major health scare. Right. Uh, I had I had a situation that happened. I got I had an allergic reaction to a medication that put me in the hospital uh, right. and then I almost died. And it was this very strange it, it almost it almost sounds like a movie plot, right? You suddenly have your family around your bed and you're just like, you're, you're sitting there going like, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. You're looking yeah. out the window and it's snowing and you just go, you know what? If I make it out of this alive, that's it. I'm going mm -hmm. all in on this mm -hmm. thing that I've been pursuing for nights and weekends for most of my adult life. I'm going to actually commit to, to, to really trying to make this happen yeah. and, and put all of my energy into it in a way that I never really had been able to before. Mm. And I, I wanna ask you more about your near-death experience sure. uh, just in a moment. Before we get there, I wanna just understand then, Kemp, because so many of the people who are joining us today, they're Smash scholars and alums and they're thinking about their own futures. Can you help us to understand when you were say 18 or 19, what did you envision for yourself? What did you think, if you can recall back then, you know, you were a talented student, you went to Howard University, yeah. um, you had some real challenges in childhood as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, at 18, I have to say, I was still questioning whether going to college was even the right thing, because mm -hmm. I was very torn. I was a part mm -hmm. of me was very interested in becoming a firefighter. Um, becoming, I wanted to join the New York Fire Department, um, mm -hmm. and and that was just, you know, I always had a lot of respect for for firefighters, and and you have to understand, you have to understand that the the educational situation that I was in. I'm from New York City, mm -hmm. but the last two years of high school, my mom had actually moved down to Virginia, um, mm -hmm. and being in the South was a lot different. Uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I there wasn't as much encouragement at the school that I happened to be attending for mm -hmm. going to, to college. In fact, I had several teachers tell me that that would have been a bad move. They, <laughs> they, they would tell me things like, you, the best bet for you is to um, join the military or get a job at- A um, trade. Yeah, a trade job in Newport. Okay. For, I was in Newport News, Virginia, so it was Newport News Shipbuilding, um, mm -hmm. basically building um, aircraft carriers. That was the big, um, business down there. And I almost went to school out of defiance. Mm. I was like, I'll show you. I'm, I think I'm smart. Um, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I, uh, I I didn't, going at, at, at 18 years old, all I knew is that I really loved to read. Um, and I really loved to, to write like stories on my own. So mm. I, I majored in English um, because honestly, it was just like, I have no idea what um, I'm going to do with my life. But at the very least, I know I'll get good grades um, <laughs> if I'm doing this thing. And majoring in English, I, I very quickly ended up writing for the Hilltop, which is mm -hmm. Howard University's um, student mm -hmm. paper. So mm -hmm. I, I began to be able to apply my interest into something that I could finally start seeing as, as a career. But I didn't mm -hmm. know what I was going to do, do coming in. I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I said that I was one of those kids in high school 
who was just like, oh yeah, in five years I'm going to be this. And then and I, I had mm-hmm. zero, I had zero yeah. idea. So what you're pointing to, and I think that this is a very widely experienced thing, is you're a bright person whose potential is not recognized, right? You were in that situation. For you, pursuing the life of the mind was rebellion, but you also intuited that you could. And, And not only not recognized, I'll go a step further and say my bright potential, I think, threatened some people. Mm. Um, I, it was a, mm. I was a real square peg in a round hole at, at my high school. I mean, mm. I went to a school that was, I'd say, I think it was 85 or 90 percent um, black African-American. Um, mm. But for the most part, the only folks that they were, the students, the teachers were interested in were, were the athletes, were football and basketball players. Mm. You know, it was a big, it was a school that, you know, produced a lot of pro football players and, and mm. pro basketball players. Whereas I was this weird kind of nerdy kid from Brooklyn who <laughs> did Taekwondo, you know what I mean? And watched uh-huh. Doctor Who. Uh-huh. So they didn't really know what to make of me. And, and I think that the, the very thing, yeah, the, those, those things that made me me uh-huh. uh, were not received very well. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's, it's really, and, and I don't say that to throw any of my school teachers under the bus. It's just that <laughs> sometimes the world doesn't get you. Um, and, and you feel like the world doesn't get you, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. You know, mm-hmm. thankfully I had a really strong family and a strong group of friends. I jokingly say that like my, my crew, when I was in Virginia, I was like their goodwill hunting. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I was that, people too young to know that movie. Just go watch it. Okay. Yeah. I was like that super duper smart guy in the crew and the crew loved that. I was so smart. You know what I mean? For so, sure. You were the nerd. Yeah, I was the nerd. And they love that. So, you, you right. know, they just were happy. They were like, oh, yeah, we got a nerd who can fight. And that was good enough for them. That's so right. I, I kind of had my little niche and my, and my little crew that, mm-hmm. that did support me. Um, and so I, I kind of I kind of took on this persona of just being defiant. Mm. And that, I just want to highlight then what you're saying, because it's not just that you had the people that were willing to cut you down, but you had this core community that actually lifted you as well, that appreciated. I, I always hate when people imply that when you come from a poor background, that your community is like against you if you're mm. smart or you want to pursue mm. an education, because mm. that's not what I, I come from a poor community, mm-hmm. um, very, very poor, both in Brooklyn and in Virginia. Mm -hmm. You know, so I lived in Woodsong Projects in Newport News. Like I'm my whole background is lower middle class to poor. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that the people around me express nothing but pride and what Mm -hmm. they saw is my potential and and my talent. And Mm -hmm. and I think that does happen quite often. It's not always Mm -hmm. like the the hood wants to bring you down. Totally. And I've experienced that as well, I'd say. And I love that, that you're pointing it out. Yeah. Let's now Kemp, jump back into the forward momentum of your life as a creative. Uh, I cut off your story about nearly dying. Um, and the reason for that is I actually wanted to set it up. Okay, I wanted people to understand what was happening in your life on the eve of that experience. Yeah. And specifically what was happening is, like for so many creatives, creativity, creative writing, it was your side hustle, right? You had your your job job, oh, increasingly poor work in journalism. Right. And then you had your passion. And one of your passions, at least that I've read about, um, was your fixation, your intrigue, your extensive research into four Black men who embodied different roles in the civil rights struggle. Right. They were Malcolm X, uh, Cassius Clay, a.k.a. Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, the NFL legend, and the King of Soul, uh, Sam Cooke. And these four men famously spent one night together in Miami, the night that Muhammad Ali won a boxing heavyweight world championship. And that night and these men, they become your obsession. How come? Because, well, it was a real night. And I remember the day that I first discovered that they were all friends and hanging out that night. It, I've said this in interviews before. I felt like I'd accidentally discovered the Black Justice League because <laughs> you understand that, like, on the day that I read that, if you had asked me who were your the four most influential people on your life, your four icons, your four heroes, mm-hmm. I would have said Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So, and I would have said that I already knew that Malcolm and Muhammad Ali had a friendship and a relationship, but I said that not knowing not only that all four of them were friends, but that four of them were together on that night. So mm -hmm. the, 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 and, and, and the reason why I think those four were so important to me was because they represented to me, at least a nascent form of the black power movement. This preceded the black Panthers. So, you know, my parents' generation, look, uh, Malcolm X is like the patron saint of my generation. Mm -hmm. You know, Spike Lee's Malcolm X came out, you know, when I was a teenager. Um, and and so <laughs> Malcolm, we all read the autobiography when we were in high school. You know, Malcolm X quotables are just like on TV. It was like Malcolm X was our entire life. But it was this idea of mil militants and self-sufficiency which was really, really um, appealing to, to my generation. And all four of them represented different versions of that self-sufficiency, you know, militants. And the word that I use the most, they were unapologetic about their blackness. Mm -hmm. you know? Like being black was not something you had to make an excuse for or explain away or mm -hmm. should be embarrassed of. And, you know, I've always said that if I've always believed that if if the world were the Serengeti, black people, we'd be the lions, you mm. know, which mm. it's, I, I've always seen it as a privilege That's a powerful to, yeah, to be a black man. Mm -hmm. and, and so these men, these four men represented that in a very clear way that made me always look up to all four. So, mm -hmm. of course, when I found out that all four of them were just kicking it, mm -hmm. that like, lit my imagination on fire. Right. And one of the first things I looked at was how old they were on that night. That's mm -hmm. that's the thing. Cassius Clay was 22, um, mm -hmm. Brown was 28, right. Sam had just turned 30, and Malcolm hadn't turned 40 yet. So mm -hmm. on the day that yeah. I read that passage mm -hmm. and kind of started doing my research, I was older than everyone else in the room mm. on mm -hmm. that, which made me think, mm -hmm. you can, uh, it reminds you that all great movements, mm -hmm. be they the civil rights movement, any great movement is a youth movement. Mm. And often in this, mm -hmm. in, in, and putting people up and making them icons, mm -hmm. young people can often feel like we can never accomplish the things that they do. But mm -hmm. they look at it and go, oh my God, they were like kids when they were doing it and they didn't know what they were doing. Okay. They were flying by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that young people really need to be reminded of. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. is such a big icon. Everything that he was doing was in his early 30s. Right. I, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really something to, to remind young people of. Mm -hmm. And he did all that in the shadow of his his father. He wasn't even he wasn't even the the, the head pastor at his church, right. Martin Luther King Jr. His father well, was. <laughs> what I will say though, Kemp, and I appreciate the the point about how young these historic figures are. It's an important reminder because we have a tendency in our society to disparage youth leadership. Like we talk yeah. about young people, like oh they're just snowflakes, or oh this or that, and it's like, but you look at the history books. It's young people who are leading the massive change that we'll talk about decades or centuries later. I think that's a great point. I do want to highlight, Kemp, that when I was able to watch One Night in Miami, I unfortunately did not watch the theater production, which I wish I could have. But the film, what struck me is you as a mature man could look at these four very different figures and with a lot of compassion show incredibly tense rifts between them without making one bad or good. Mm -hmm. And I was curious in your ability to kind of look at them and put them antagonistically and have them fighting with each other, right. but not demonizing or glorifying a single one. Is right. that something you could have done earlier or is that something that you feel like you've learned to do or see over time? I, I no, I, I don't think I could have done it earlier because I didn't have that level of empathy. I mean, first and foremost, I credit my journalism career and having mm -hmm. interviewed thousands and thousands of people over the years with mm -hmm. powering my ability to write in different voices as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. So that was one key element of it was like making sure that all four of them didn't sound like the same person. And mm -hmm. the process of writing both the play and the film, I equated to playing a chess game against yourself. If I set a chess board on, on the table and I make a move, and then later on in the day I come back and I make the opposite move, I'm not going to make a weaker move on one side. I'm, I'm basically trying to win against uh -huh. myself. 
So if, if this yeah. was a verbal chess match, I wanted to make sure that I made the strongest possible move from each of the players. In mm -hmm. terms of their positions, the, the interesting thing is, while I was inspired by the real knight, the debate that they have, I've always told people, it's just my internal monologue come to life. Mm. It's like taking mm. the very thing that I struggle with in my own psyche and reverse engineering it back into the mouths of the specific men that inspired me to think that way. Mm. So, you know, it really is every time I say yes or no to a particular job or an assignment, that's my internal Malcolm arguing with my internal Sam. <laughs> you know, just serious. Like that's that's what's going on inside my head. Yeah, you've given your angels names. That's I funny. really have. <laughs> and, and, and it's as simple as that. So now let's bring us to the night you already referred to. Your play, One Night in Miami, it was finally going to debut in live theater in Baltimore. Yeah. And you, having struggled for so many years, I mean, life was not easy to you. You, instead of being able to go to that performance, land in the hospital right. because of an allergic reaction to, I believe, Tamiflu. Yeah. And in this near-death experience that you'd mentioned earlier, you came out of it with a commitment to creativity. And I want to understand that. Like, explain what happened. What was the change that happened? Well, you, you know, it was, it was my opening night. It was, it was the first equity product. The, the show had debuted um, in Los Angeles a couple of years before, but that was an equity waiver production. It wasn't like a full equity production. But Baltimore was the first equity production. It was on the main stage at the State Theater of Maryland, 650 seats. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, a, it, was, it was my big premiere and I wasn't able to go. And I didn't know if I was gonna make it out of that hospital alive. It was while I was in the hospital actually that I remember contacting um, my, my last journalism job and telling him I wasn't coming back. Mm. I figured mm. I'm going to be dead <laughs> back or I'm going to get out of here and I'm still not coming back because mm. the fact that I was fighting for my life and, and just going back and forth like, oh, you're going to be able to begin tomorrow? What about mm. the day after? And it's like, I don't know. I think I'm going to die. So it, I was in a very upset, you know, upset place. Mm. But the, the thing about it was I had always you know, your, your relatives, your loved ones always want the best for you. And, and, and there's this saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mm. You know? And that's, it's, it's a saying that like, I kind of agreed with that up to that point. Um, mm. Before I took the job at AOL, I had been at Yahoo for many years and I've been laid off. When mm. I got laid off from that job, um, I had, a, I'm sure a lot of young people know what this means, but my stock had been vested. As mm. part of my payment for the job, I was given company stock. And I've been there long enough that the stock was vested. Now, mm -hmm. that vested stock equaled about two years worth of my salary. So I, I had two years salary in the bank. Now, mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, you that's savings. You know, that's, that's important money. Now I'm going to go get another job. But I, I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to give myself two years to do the thing that I never really did with my creative writing, which is mm -hmm. devote 100% of my energy to it. Mm -hmm. um, and when when the when the account runs dry, if I haven't been able to finally get a foothold in this industry after mm -hmm. all these years, then I will walk away from it and I will never complain about it again because I'll know I've given it my all. But mm -hmm. I won't have to wonder what if I had just given it my all. That's so interesting. So you really needed to almost lose life. Yes. To have the courage to use the resource in front of you. You actually had savings. You had that padding, yeah. but you couldn't do the full dive until. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, absolutely. And, and it, it's hard to have that kind of courage because, like I said, your family, they put so much energy into you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, a, that's the thing with the arts in general is, mm -hmm. is that I try to explain this to people that the arts, an, an artistic career it's already so competitive, but it is not a coincidence that most of the people in this business come from a certain amount of privilege because Absolutely. your chances of failure are so much higher. In fact, yeah. most people pursuing it, chances are you're going to be able, you're going to fail. So you have to have a certain amount of privilege to even be able to do it. It's why mm -hmm. it's recently become an issue, the idea of unpaid internships, 
because right. who can afford mm -hmm. to accept an unpaid internship? The very privileged in people, exactly. exactly. And exactly. those internships lead to the real careers. Correct. A lot of yeah. people who study and prepare for it can mm -hmm. never get into because they can't afford to take the unpaid internship. I want to shout out to ProPublica who did the uh, some of the most impactful reporting on that issue. Yeah. And, you know, Kemp, what it, this point that you're making, when I kind of listen to it and I want to think about how is this then actionable advice for people who come from not privilege, but who have, like you, the creative fire, it sounds like if I were to look at your life example, it's that you did kind of suck it up and you did kind of do the thing that paid the bills and you yeah. did kind of throw that money into the bank. Yes. And then you finally though had the courage to say, okay, let's see what I'm made of. Yes, you you have to plan better mm -hmm. than everyone else around you. Mm -hmm. You have to struggle more. You have to have more of a budget. You have to really stick to it. There mm -hmm. were other people who were doing the things that I was doing and mm -hmm. they would celebrate and go out to a party that I couldn't wouldn't go to because I wasn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't spend that money on drinks. Mm -hmm. Like it really is like, I, I didn't need to remind myself that I didn't have the same cushion that a lot of these other people did. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I was existing in a very, even after having some of my first earliest successes, none of that changed things like keeping a budget, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and right. very, I, I mean, if, if there's anything that I, uh, that I wish um, there was more of, um, mm -hmm. and it was taken more seriously, particularly when we were young, it's things like home ec and planning, because, mm -hmm. Being able to balance a checkbook uh, when you're 18 years old and they, you know, your first year in college, all of a sudden you have five credit cards. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, the mistakes they make with those cards are going to ruin, it's going to ruin their credit so badly that they're never going to be able to get out of it. And mm -hmm. I think that it's things like that. Those are the types of things. I have children of my own now. I have mm -hmm. a 17-year-old who's about to graduate high school and a 22-year-old. Mm -hmm who just graduated college, magna cum laude, and she's already- Congratulations. But, but you know, I, it's really about reminding them about these very basic life skills. I gave my son a checking account for his 12th birthday, mm. you know, and he, and I wanted to see, it took him about a week to bounce his first check. <laughs> and I tell That's you an what, important lesson that, to learn. That kid is 17 now, and he hasn't bounced a check in four years. Mm. And I, he manages, that checking account, he'll manage it down to the penny, you know, oh, and, and these are skills that I think I learned them a little bit later, but that just goes to show you're never too old to learn. I learned it in my 20s and 30s, but mm -hmm. those were the things that enabled me to kind of make that transition. That's wonderful. We are going to run out of time for the questions I get to ask you and then move over to the audience with their questions. I'll try to sneak mine in continually throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question for you that I mean, Tell us about the call you got from Pixar that <laughs> led now to this whirlwind experience of being a historic figure in Pixar history, right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because for people who don't know, it's not like writing Pixar movies, that's a job you apply for, or directing them is a job you apply for. They just take interest in different people's voices. And when, when I heard that Pixar was interested in me, the first question was like, what of mine that have they actually read? Like, how do they know who I am? And it turns out the thing that made them interested in bringing me in was they'd read my play One Night in Miami. So One Night in Miami was actually the thing that made Pixar want to work with me as, as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I came in um, and they showed me a very, very early 2D boarded version of what would become the film Soul. And they just asked my honest opinion about it. And, I, and I, I was just honest because I had nothing to lose. I saw it as a project that had great potential, but that was also, there were lots of problems. But mm -hmm. for any problem that I saw, I made sure that I had a potential solution of how I would fix it, and I presented those. And by the end of it, they were like, you know, we think you might be the, the right person to help us um, make this film. And well, mm -hmm. you know, I guess it depends on whether you actually like the final product or not, but. I'd like to think that I was because um, I'm, I'm really proud of, of how Soul turned out. As you should be, I believe, very much so. Um, we're now going to bring in some audience questions as we continue to talk with each other. Sure. I believe I'm going to be reading the questions, not asking the people who've asked them to come and speak. Um, and if that's wrong, someone message me to tell me so. Great. Uh, so one of the first questions from Isaiah White, very popular question, 
it's what exactly do film directors do mm -hmm. and what are some of the challenges, if there are any, that come with being a film director? There's lots of challenges. And <laughs> in terms of what a film director does, the simplest way for me to describe it is um, air traffic control. Because mm -hmm. um, the reality is filmmaking is a very collaborative um, process. Um, there, there's, um, you, you, most of us don't know the names of editors by heart, but an editor is, is one of the key jobs to making a film and, and the look of certain films, it comes down to the editor, your director of photography, you know, the script, the screenwriter. Um, but the director is the person who has the vision for the overall film and is air traffic control and is responsible for, for executing that, that vision um, in a film. Um, and it requires a lot of different kinds of skills, certain artistic skills, of course, in terms of having a certain eye, but also a certain amount of management skills, because mm -hmm. directing is also as much a management job um, as it is a creative mm -hmm. um, artistic job. Mm -hmm. So managing the entire fleet of talent that is doing this work. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was the experience like working on Soul? That's a question from Timothy Xavier Watson. And Sure, go ahead. No, no, I would just want to elaborate a little bit on it. I don't want to project onto Timothy what he was thinking, but you know, you be, being the first ex to do something um, often means a lot of awkward conversations and painful moments. Yes, and that was no different. Uh, I tell people that Soul was both the most difficult job I've ever had in my life um, and the most gratifying. Um, definitely the most gratifying in that there were so many difficult, uncomfortable conversations that 15 years ago, younger me would have just kind of kept my mouth shut. Just, mm. You just want to not ruffle any feathers, not make any waves and just mm. like, get the job done. But I realized how much was at stake with this film and how important it was that we get it right or as close to right as humanly possible. Because the reality of Hollywood is Hollywood loves to learn bad lessons. You know, <laughs> Hollywood loves to say things like, oh, black movies don't travel overseas or like all these crazy things that are not true, but mm. they're like accepted as things in Hollywood and they're so hard to disprove. I didn't realize going in, I knew that Joe Gardner was like the first black lead, but I didn't mm. realize I was the first black writer or director on a Pixar movie like that someone had to tell me that. And I was like, oh boy, like that's, mm. uh, it, it, it's a, it, it helped me understand why at certain days felt like a certain amount of struggle because you are, you're struggling and you're building bridges hopefully so that the next person that comes behind you will have a slightly easier time. Mm. You know, because that's what it's really about. It's about mm. building trust. Um, there's an expression at Pixar, it's called a brain trust. Yeah. Um, Pixar films, like I'm still in the Pixar brain trust. So mm -hmm. Soul is long done, but I watch other people's movies now um, mm -hmm. as part of brain trust screenings and give them my notes. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is about having gained the trust of the other artists, the other writers and directors around me by mm -hmm. both being open mm -hmm. to their comments and being supportive of other people's projects. You mm -hmm. know, it's a lot mm -hmm. of soft skills mm -hmm. that Thankfully, I think being a journalist kind of helped me with a lot of that stuff. Mm. Can you briefly just give an example of, you're saying you had the confidence to, to say things maybe a younger version of you would not have been able to, the hard conversations. What's a little example of that? I mean, this is a public forum, so I don't want to like give away uh -huh. things about like what could have happened with the film and people uh -huh. who could have been in it versus people who couldn't have been in it. But Let's go ahead, Kev. <laughs> no, it's, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm making a family movie and this is one of the first things that I was like, it's Disney. So like everyone in my family is gonna see this. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything we're doing that I feel is going to embarrass me, you know what I mean? Like that my mom is gonna be like embarrassed or my, she's the, you know what I mean? A family member is gonna be around their coworkers and be like, oh, so that's your relative, they did that. I wanted to make sure that that wasn't in the film, anything like that. So anything that kind of raised a red flag for me, um, I was pretty vocal about like, this is a huge, huge, you know, red flag. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we're and not I, gonna say a red flag here. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so and and so uh, you uh, and and that was something that happened soon after I started on the job. I remember because I'm I'm based um in Los Angeles and in New York, but when you're working on a Pixar film, you're actually in the Bay Area. So I actually lived up in Emeryville and Oakland for two years while I was working on Soul. And mm -hmm. our first week that I got there, there was one of those discussions that happened where I, I kind of raised my hand as the new guy and said, I, 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 as the only, I was the only voice in the room who said, I think this is a terrible idea and mm -hmm. here's why. And mm -hmm. I had to make the case for it. And ultimately, I ended up winning out on that. But that's one of those things where when you're younger, you're more, we're more worried about, oh, my God, am I going to lose my job? Am yeah, I gonna yeah. enemies? But I was coming from an honest, sincere place. And I always yeah. was. Yeah, it's a power that you get having been put through the ringer in so many ways. Yeah, I was right. like, what do I have to lose? You know what I mean? It's like sure. you, I, you kind of feel like the Joker after a while. Like, what are you going to do to me that hasn't been done? Right. <laughs> another, que <laughs> another question from Leilani F. Um, again, a bit, uh, you know, pragmatic. What do you recommend for someone who wants to get into the film industry to be successful in that environment? And let's keep in mind who we're talking to. We're talking to people who probably don't have moms and dads who are in the industry. Right, right. I mean, well, the wonderful thing about the film industry, particularly now the, with streaming, is that there's such a demand for it. It's called, con they call it content. But there's such a demand for films and TV shows stories. that yeah. stories from all different representing all different kinds of people that there's no one way into the industry anymore. 10, 15 years ago, the only way really to get into the industry as a screenwriter, for example, was probably to be an assistant um, to a television showrunner of a writer's room. And then eventually you become a staff writer, whereas mm -hmm. now it's not uncommon for playwrights who've never written for television to go right into TV shows, in some cases as showrunners. I think the industry is after powerful, interesting stories, and they really don't care where those stories come from. So mm -hmm. if you have one of those stories, um, and if, you have, if you're capable of telling stories like that, there's, no, there, there's a myriad different ways to get in. The thing you do have control over, though, is knowing your craft, you know, if you decide that you want to do a certain thing, raw talent is a lovely thing, but there's a certain amount of like perseverance and knowing your craft and just treating people decently, which I know sounds like a given, but you'd be surprised how many people kind of come out of the gate, display a little bit of talent and, and kind of act like jerks. Yeah, no, it goes a long way to not be a jerk. It, it really, really does. does. <laughs> if you are, I guess if you're a jerk, you're a jerk, but uh -huh. it, it's, um, it goes a long way to just treat people the way you would like to be treated, I right. guess. <laughs> and, and that's. Yeah, you know, Kemp, I do want to also, now I want to take the liberty of actually interpreting your experience to respond to that question about how do you get in. It seems like letting yourself create something that is excellent, that is truly from your passion, because it's really, what was your calling card to Pixar, it was One Night in Miami. It's not the calling card people would have expected. No, and understand, One Night in Miami, the play, there were a lot of people who did not think it was a good idea for a play and they didn't think it worked. I would get notes like, this play is terrible, nothing happens. It's just four guys in a room talking. Why would anyone, <laughs> serious, why would anyone want to watch this? Um, right. You, why you should have the FBI kick the door down. Where's the action? I mm -hmm. mean, it, it's only because I so loved, when I was in school, in high school, they played for my classroom, 12 Angry Men, um, mm -hmm. a, a film from the 1950s. And the entire film, it's Henry Fonda, um, it's, it's a jury. It's 12 men in a jury who are debating about whether someone who's accused of murder is guilty or not. And mm -hmm. if them think he's guilty, one guy thinks he's not, he's innocent. And mm -hmm. over the course of the two hours, the one guy convinces the other 11 Mm -hmm. to change their vote. So mm -hmm. to me, 12 Angry Men has more action in it than John Wick. Mm -hmm. And it's really a film of words, mm -hmm. you know? But those words are excitement. So to mm -hmm. me, One Night in Miami was a boxing match, but it was mm -hmm. a boxing match using words to throw jabs and punches. And right. I got it. But a lot of people thought, no, they, they're like, no, it doesn't work absolutely. Just right. Exactly. <laughs> right, right, all right. One more question from you, Camp. Uh, for you, Camp. Uh, Angel Canedo Martinez asks: 
in your opinion, what makes a good movie and what separates good movies from the best? Oh, that's completely subjective, mm. completely subjective, because one of my favorite movies is is Point Break. It's like mm. a, an old Keanu Reeves movie about surfers who rob banks. I don't know why I love that movie, but I just freaking <laughs> love that movie. I mean, there's a chase yeah. scene through a backyard where a dude literally throws yeah. a pitbull at another dude. Yeah. And I don't so know it's why. the action movie you did not create. Yeah, I didn't, it's a movie I didn't, so it's it's totally subjective. But I think a good movie on a base level connects to you. It connects to someone. It connects to an audience. It connects you on some emotional, visceral level. Mm. Um, it displays some amount. It, a, a great movie, I think, speaks to some universal truth because that's what I always strive for. And the stories that I tell, I always strive to reach universal truths. And I feel like universal means universal as in everyone in the world should be able to understand this regardless of the race or gender of the characters in the film. So mm -hmm. I think those are really great movies, the ones that speak to like universal truths. As Soul absolutely does. You feel this black protagonist who wants to be a musician stuck teaching middle school and you feel the pain of not living your dream. Yes, that, and that's exactly what we were going for, so yes. Well, you did it, hats off. <laughs> Kent Powers, thank you so much for speaking with me. I've loved the time we've had together. I wanna to thank all the Smash community for throwing in such great questions and being so vocal in chat, making us feel like, hey, we're doing a good job here. People are engaged, it's wonderful. So thank you for that. I now want to turn it over to Smash's CEO, Danielle Rose. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, I think we are on. Thank you all for a little patience there. Necessary that was necessary. Um, okay, so definitely, I there's so much that that came about as a result of this very spirited conversation. Thank you, thank you so much, um, both Arthi and Kemp Powers. Kemp Powers for sharing your incredible story as a fellow HBCU alum, uh, an incredibly proud Spelman alumna. Uh, and as newly appointed CEO, it is, it is with great soul and spirit that I thank you, Kemp Powers, for sharing your incredible journey and Jim's with us. So much of what you shared, I can confidently say, resonated with all of us here as members of the Smash community um, by not only the, the deluge of comments in, in the chat, but what really how we approach STEM education in Smash. Um, that's a rookie mistake. Uh, my apologies for that. But, you know, in terms of just 
couple of things I just wanted to highlight for the Smash community still here. Really, um, just you reinforce for us that we absolutely should be embracing our authentic selves. Uh, defiance, acts of resistance fueled by your passion can absolutely take you on a nonlinear but beautiful and fruitful journey. Uh, the world doesn't always get you and that's okay. Community is essential and will always keep you lifted. Choosing the right community is of course um, important. And really thank you for dispelling the myth that the hood isn't against you. Um, and so I just wanted to thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Arthi, for really expertly guiding us through this experience. Um, and just thank you for being an inspiring human being. Thank you, Smash community. And absolutely thank you to the welcome platform team and family. So again, much appreciation. And if anyone here on the line who is not a part of our core Smash community, you want to learn more about us, please, by all means, visit us at smash.org. And also look out for invitations to our national competition at the end of this summer. And at, we'll actually, we're almost towards the end of the summer in a couple of weeks in August, really to get the the greater essence of even what our Smash scholars have been working on this summer. So again, thank you all so much and please have a, a great rest of your day, rest of your week. And may we all remain undaunted by the good fight. Nerds do fight, nerds are defiant, um, but it's all for the greater good. Take care. for what you got some people may not have that but just be thankful whatever you got let's go oh you may not drop a great big Cadillac gangsta white walls TV antenna in the back you may
Just be 